What's up guys, this episode we're going to build their very first API and talk about all the little details that you will need to be concerned with when you're building out your own APIs. So first off, let's start by creating a new application called Weather. What we'll do is we'll build a little bit of a weather service. So you might imagine that um, your iPhone has to hit the server to get the current temperature when it displays that. So we'll be building that server for recording and uh, extracting the current temperature for these locations. So our application is going to require a couple things. We'll have a location model. Every location will have a name. Ideally, you would also add a geolocation uh, to this so that your location can be searched upon. So wherever you are currently at on your phone, you could search for the closest city or something like that and return the uh, temperature for that. But in our case, we're gonna keep this simple and start with just a name. Then we also need a model for the actual temperature and status of the location. So we'll just have like a recording model with a um, location references, a temperature as an integer and a status, which could be sunny, rainy, cloudy, uh, whatever the case. So we'll run rakedb migrate and set up our database. And we can open this up and maybe go into our seeds to set up some example data. So here we might say uh, L equals location dot create name is New York City and L dot recordings dot create uh, temp is maybe um, 32 degrees and cloudy. So then maybe we also add some historical data in here. So maybe it was a little warmer before, um, maybe it got a little colder to 28 degrees and went really cold to 22. And it was just kind of alternating between rainy and cloudy, but then it became sunny and 22 degrees out. So we can have uh, our data like this, obviously, you would want to record the actual timestamps for each of these days um, or temperatures or whatever if this is checked hourly or on a minute basis. Um, you can go and also set the created at on this. We're just going to create all of these uh, at once and we'll order them by ID rather than created at so that we can um, see them in order. We need to set location.rb to has many recordings. Then we can hop into our terminal and run rake db seed to add those to our database. And if we load up our Rails console, we should be able to see location.last.recordings.last. And that should give us that temperature of 22 and sunny, and it does. So that means our um, database is all set up. So now we need to go into our application and start building out our API. The way we're going to do this is by going into our routes and we're gonna add a namespace in here for the API. And the reason why we wanna use a namespace here is because we can then define our resources routes for locations and underneath them we can also say resources recordings so that you could grab say historical data or whatever. Um, and that will separate those out from uh, resources locations down here, which might be for the browser to load up the HTML page for it instead. So our API can be designed in a separate folder and that will separate out the controllers and the views for it in case you're using um, JBuilder to render the JSON for the API. So this allows us to have those two separate sections of our routes that are specific to the API and we can contain that all in the same Rails app, which can be nice. Now the other thing I want to add here is another namespace though for version 1 so that we can begin versioning our API. There are a lot of different ways you can go about versioning. Stripe has a really interesting one where it records the current version of the API and then saves it to your account so that it automatically remembers that version, which is pretty neat. A more typical, um, simpler approach. The reason why you will want to version your API is that you may not control 
all of the code in one app. So when you deploy your Rails app, your mobile app might be separate, and if it hasn't been updated at the exact same second as your Rails app, then your users will probably see breaking stuff. So that might mean that logins don't work or they can't pull the weather or any of that stuff. And that would be really bad. So you need to do it in versions so that you can say, okay, this version has this functionality. The mobile app can implement that. But when we want to change it, we roll out a new version. And then once that is rolled out, then our mobile app can opt in to using the new version. Now this is important for your own kind of separate teams. So maybe your mobile app is a separate development team than your Rails app. You can deploy those independently. But this also becomes incredibly valuable when you have other random people building against your API. So if you have a public API that anyone can use, you don't wanna go break their code, so you need to version it so that they can choose to upgrade versions and you can communicate to them, well, we rolled out version three, so we're turning off version one at this date, so make sure that you upgrade if you no longer wanna support it. So versioning is gonna be important. We'll talk about that more in the future. Stripe has some really, really interesting approaches to that, which I wanna talk about when we get around to talking about versioning more. But um, this is all we really need to do to create our routes. So let's go into building our resources. Now, right before we do that, let's take a look at rake routes. This is going to show us that our uh, URLs are API v1 locations and slash recordings after that if you want to access those. And the namespace actually creates folders um, for our controllers and our views for these in the API. So that means that our controllers are gonna be a little bit different than normal. We're gonna to need to create a directory inside of app controllers and we'll call it app controllers uh, API. And then we'll make a directory called app controllers API v1. And inside of there, we can say, let's edit app controllers API v1 locations controller.rb. And this will be the file that we will edit. So let me open that up. And we'll have our API v1 locations controller. This will just inherit from application controller as normal. And we will have our show action. This would be what you would request for a specific location's temperature. So we'll use that. We will have before action set location, just like you normally would expect in a regular um, Rails controller. So we'll have set location. This is going to grab it by the ID. So we'll have at location equals location dot find params ID. And then really all we need to do is build our view for this. So we need to make a directory called app views API. We need to make one inside of that called V1 and one inside of that called locations. And here we can say edit app views look API v1 locations show dot json dot jbuilder, which is built into Rails. It gives you the ability to say json dot uh, whatever attribute name that you want. So you can say id, and this can be at location dot id and json dot name at location dot name, and then you can have anything you want like a block and this could be the current recording uh, temperature. So we might say here, temp is at location.recordings.last.temp, and the status would be the status. So this is a way for you to kind of define your JSON output visually in a structure, which is kind of nice. And this structure allows us to actually put our JSON formatting into the views folder, which can kind of organize this a little bit nicer for us in some cases. Now, you could also do this and just say render JSON and create a hash in here and return the exact same format of a hash. So you could say location.id and so on, where you could replace the format with just a regular old Ruby hash. Now the nice part about this is that 
Um, Rails knows that we are looking for the JSON type of file format when we request this. So we can just define it in our views folder and it will figure out how to render that for us. Now let's start our Rails server and try this out in the browser. Now the reason why this works nicely in our browser is because we don't actually have any um, authentication yet. So we're not passing in a token. We can just load it up in our browser and see our JSON as we created it. So as you can see, JBuilder effectively just builds a hash um, and then it's in JSON format and our browser can then parse that out into an object in JavaScript. What's really neat about this is that now that we have this URL, we can go into anything we want. We could go into Python or Swift or Android or Ruby or JavaScript, and we can hit that URL and we can grab that data. So even if we were in Bash and we wanted to run curl, we can grab the data in a curl request and then parse that string response as JSON, and then our Bash code could even have uh, access to that. So you can build your own stuff to consume this API now, and if it ever changed, maybe the format changes, so we don't have current anymore or something, then you could update the version and that's really the only difference that you would need to uh, change. And the other cool thing about this is if you notice, this code is nothing special to APIs. The only thing that we did was we introduced a version, but the rest of this code is very, very much your standard Rails controller code. The um, Output of the show action is in JSON JBuilder format, which is fairly common if you happen to write JavaScript to make an AJAX request to load up some data um, dynamically rather than HTML. So this is almost exactly what you would normally write. And I wanted to point that out because there's a lot of confusion between uh, how do I write regular Rails code and I need to do an API and it seems like it's a different thing. It's really not a different thing. It just has chosen to use a little bit different authentication, which we haven't talked about yet. It uses versioning and it uses JSON. And there's just really not a whole lot more that's specific to APIs. They are really pretty much the same as building your normal Rails app. Now with that said, there are important details that we do need to take into account to build an easy to work with API. For example, if we were to remove .json as the format, we're gonna get an error, unknown format. And the reason for that is because, well, we didn't specify the extension in the URL. If our uh, API is always going to return JSON or is the default, we might as well force our uh, controller to make sure that it uses JSON all the time. So one of the ways we can do that is we could build our own uh, API controller. So if we go into app controllers and say API controller.rb, we can say class API controller that inherits from application controller. And this could say before action set default format. And we can have a method in here called that and it can say request.format equals json and override whatever is in the url that way we always have that format and we can say api controller is the class that we inherit from now for all of our api controllers and that way this is kind of acting as the parent and enforcing all these kind of defaults upon all of your api controllers so that is nice because now we can request this without .json and we are going to get the expected result every time. The trouble with that is of course, if you wanted to support other formats like XML, it is not going to work, but you can just simply tweak this code to say, well, if it's XML, leave it. If it's anything other than XML, force it to JSON and uh, that will work. So that's it for this episode. We are gonna be diving into authentication, formatting your JSON in a better format than just kind of arbitrary formats. Um, we'll talk about more versioning, error handling, and a lot more in the next episode. So I will talk to you then.